Started. So hi everybody, my name is Fraser Kane. I am the publisher of Universe Today and this is your virtual star party for January 6, 2013. So joining us tonight with telescopes, we've got uh, Mike Barrent in, oh sorry, Mark Barrent in uh, Chicago. And Chicago, and so and Mark has got a view, I think that's the Orion Nebula. It, his... it, 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 it is, uh, I'm trying to bring it in better here right now. <laughs> <clears throat> I, are you doing it live, or are you doing like a, like a longer exposure? Um, I'm trying to. I'm yeah. struggling with software here at the moment, trying to get okay. Manny Cam to show a picture of my backyard EOS window. So, okay, well, well, we'll see if you can if you can bring that up yeah. in a little while. So we'll we'll yep. get to there. We got Mike Phillips, who has got. Oh, look at that Jupiter! <laughs> oh, how you guys is, doing? That is fantastic, Mike. That's actually F twenty five. Let's fix that. And and this is your eight inch telescope, not the uh, not the fourteen. Right. I didn't trust the clouds or the conditions, so I said I'll just go quick and dirty tonight. Okay, quick and dirty is working beautifully, actually. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Always happy to we, share. And we got Stuart Foreman, who is in the San Francisco area, and Stuart has got a nice view of the uh, open cluster. Was this M fifty eight? Thirty eight. Thirty eight. M thirty eight. Yeah. Right. And. Uh, I think Stuart, you might be muted. I might have muted you, so you might have to keep muting because <laughs> we're getting some echo from you. But and then joining us for color commentary, we've got uh, Gary Ganella, who has in the LA area, who strangely uh, has clouds. I I don't understand how this happened. I don't know. I wasn't good. I wasn't a good <laughs> boy this year. <clears throat> because normally you you never have clouds. You are. Super dependable living in the LA area. This time of year, yeah. January, February, we get a lot of clouds. So the the real question is, which of us from the VSP bought new gear? <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was Ray Sanders. Hey Ray, no telescope tonight, only his brain. So, I think we might have gotten the short end of the stick on that one. <laughs> but Ray's going to be running Stellarium tonight, so uh, we'll be able to display some virtual stars. Uh, and finally, we've got Dr. Phil Plate. Hey, Phil. Hey, how's it going? Good. So it's a bit of an auspicious day. I don't know if anybody knows about this, uh, but this is actually the one-year anniversary of the Virtual Star Party. So if you look back into <laughs> ancient... <laughs> oh, <my gusta. laughs> if you look back nice. into ancient Star like Party that. history, um, you'll see that we did the first sort of tentative... Uh, tests of doing some of this live telescope streaming on January 4th, 2012. So uh, we have decided that that is the sort of start date of the virtual star party. And here we are one year later with Happy uh, dozens of star parties under our belt and I hope oh, a, a vastly improved technology and uh, <laughs> You, Very nice. you weren't Yay. sure whether you should use that technology, Phil, and you have already gotten completely up to speed with it. So I, I well, think, I, uh, I, I couldn't turn it on. Once it was on, it became easy. All right. <laughs> um, and then because I love playing with the uh, the Hangout soundboard, I had to give us all a round of applause, especially oh, you, Fraser. Oh, oh, for oh that was right. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Phil had the little Migusta face, and then <laughs> I decided to uh, to jump in with applause. Um, and so, so yeah, so one year, and so uh, now if you go to the CosmoQuest page, they've actually got a really good link to the archive, and you can go back to the uh, back to the beginning and see the, our first tentative uh, tests. Um, we did it with Sabine Jacob uh, back, like I said, January fourth, and it was uh, it was very rough, but you could see the potential because there was like a moon in the uh, in the hangout, and then uh, and here we are today, a year later. So I think it's. Uh, it's pretty cool, and of course, if anyone's missed it, Google uh, did a cool documentary about the uh, about the project. Uh, they've showcased us during a, a bunch of live events. They've been in, we've been included in the best of the year um, stuff for Google Plus. So it's uh, it's been really good. What what a year! And then also, if I understand correctly, Fraser um, at uh, AAS, uh, Scott's going to be presenting about the VSP, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. So we're short a couple of people tonight because uh, Scott Lewis is actually presenting. Uh, we're getting a is that you, Ray? Getting a, like a weird buzzing sound from someone. No, I was muted. Weird. I wonder where that's coming from. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So uh, right. So so uh, Scott and Nicole and Pamela are all at the American Astronomical Society annual meeting down in uh, Long Beach, California, and they are presenting uh, the virtual star party as, sort of as part of their research. They're showing sort of what the attendance has been 
what kind of uh, outreach it's been for this the astronomical community, what the response has been, and to sort of show that that doing this kind of research or, and kind of outreach is really good for uh, just for education and astronomy enthusiasm in general. So, and so it was great, Scott, to actually handle the uh, star party for the last uh, two weeks while while we were. Uh, Away on vacation. As in case you didn't know, we uh, went down to. We participated in the not the end of the world cruise. So uh, me and uh, Pamela and I brought my family. We uh, noodled around the uh, the Caribbean uh, on a cruise ship and actually visited Mayan ruins and uh, and stuff to celebrate the world not ending, which was a great time. And uh, so if anyone was there is watching this, good to see you again. But yeah, it was great. We we recorded live shows of Astronomy Cast, and we had a we had a really good, we, we did stargazing on the ship. One of the coolest things is we got a chance to go to a secret sort of special area on the ship where the captain has all the lights turned off, and then we were able to bring out all of our green lasers and actually sort of show off objects in the night sky. Turns out a cruise ship is a terrible place to do astronomy though, because you're like carrying around your own light pollution. So <laughs> yeah, it was I've done that bad. a couple of times. It's tough. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's not the best platform for uh, for for like trying to do something that's astronomy related. So, but anyway, we had a great response, and I think we're going to try and figure out another thing, uh, maybe Hawaii next time, which I think will be really cool. So, anyway, stay uh, stay tuned, and we'll we'll figure out another cool sort of astro event to try and organize. So. Cool. So, so then, Mike. Um, oh, right. One last thing uh, before we get onto the actual objects we're looking at. So if you want to uh, to ask us questions, you can you can post your questions. Uh, either you can post them in uh, <clears throat> in Google Plus. Uh, if you're in, like in my stream, you can post this on, on the event page. You can post any questions onto YouTube. Now, <clears throat> to be the safest place, I highly recommend you post them over on YouTube. Uh, and at this point, Pamela will make her joke about how uh, YouTube comments are awful. And so you can raise the quality of comments on YouTube by by posting over there. But that's sort of the place that I think I can guarantee that we'll see your, your questions or comments. Um, so we're happy to take requests, anything you want to see tonight. Uh, if you have any gear questions, we'd be happy to explain it. We'll talk about tips and tricks and techniques and, and really anything you want. And we'll, uh, and we'll go for about an hour and then uh, and wrap it up. So uh, all right, let's get rolling. Um, OK, so, so Mike, can we uh, talk about your setup here? What, what's going on? Sure. So I am using a Celestron 8-inch Schmidt cast grain. And I have a, a fancy little barlow in between the telescope and the camera to make this at about an f25. I forget the exact focal length. Um, you have to do the math for me. And uh, it, we're using a color camera to display the image. It's a USB camera, and it's going directly into the Hangout. And I think we're looking at north up on Jupiter, and that's Io off to the left there. I could just see the the IO. It's like a little dot there over on the left. Can you actually right. change the the brightness so we can see the moon a little better? I can. Yeah, I have I'll to drop the, uh, the the feed to change the settings. I think though. Well, before you do that, then, um, I've seen some reports that there's a black spot on Jupiter. Uh, when I, I assume it's not replicating monoliths from uh, 2010, <laughs> but there I see a couple of black spots in your picture, and a couple of them I think are just you know, spots on the lens or something, but... There are, yes. There's, the there's left, one right. on the upper red belt, just above the equator, on the right. Yep. Yeah, it's actually a bluish uh, feature. I think it's called a festoon. Is it? It's okay. In, yeah, and it, I don't know if it shows up bluish on your side, but it looks kind of blue on mine, and those, are, those are regular features that, that happen, and I, I don't know what causes them, but they usually happen in the... So uh, the white areas are <clears throat> zones, and the, the dark areas are belts. That's right. Brown, belts are brown. That's how I remember it. And so, in between the equatorial zone and the north equatorial belt and south equatorial belt, you'll see these little blue features. They're like cascading waterfalls of sorts. And it's a little jumpy and wobbly because of the bad seeing. But uh, if I was to take a picture and you know stack all the best frames and sharpen it up, you would definitely see that it has like a almost like a if you take a paintbrush and smear paint like at a funny angle. That's that's what it looks like. It's actually kind of neat. Um, actually, the jumpiness makes it easier to see. If Does it were it? steady, <laughs> it's hard to tell what was, uh, you know, on the lens or, or on your on your plate. Uh, yeah, right, right, definitely. Whatever. You know, I can I look tried. that up. Festoon. Now that you've Festoon, said that, I remember right. the word. Yep. Right. So that's not just a an artifact on the camera or something. No, that's that one's not. A, 
Yeah, there's like a bluey feature on the surface right. of Jupiter. And, yeah, and that's huge. That's bigger than Earth. Yeah. Oh yeah. So I was thinking, I was, every time I was like, is that the Great Red Spot? And then it's never the Great Red Spot. And I was about to say, finally, I see the Great Red Spot, but it's not the Great Red Spot, <laughs> is it? Nope. <laughs> yeah, why, okay. why is the Great Red Spot never visible for us? Or maybe it always is. You know what, I think it just rotated out of view. <laughs> oh, just our luck. Yeah. Yeah, so if you can fiddle with the brightness here, and we can just see that, sure. uh, that moon. I can see it over on the left now. Me. Drop out, and then I'll come right back. And, and so we can, we have to do this. I'm seeing lots of links to people talking about festoons on Jupiter, but I'm not seeing a definition. <laughs> Everybody's saying, "Look, here's a picture of a festoon." Like, Thanks. Right. Hmm. There we go. Yeah, actually, that's... looks better over here. Yeah, it looks like you split the difference. That actually worked really well. Huh. Well, let me take. A check. It, 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 I've found in the past though, that the way I've displayed it in here makes it a little oblong. Looking. Is it no, oblong? It looks, or is it, it looks okay. No. Okay. No. Well, Jupiter is oblong. <clears throat> yes. It's very flat. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to move to Stuart well, uh, for a second here because I know Stuart's got a bunch of stuff happening. Stuart, what are we looking at here? This is the Crab Nebula M1. That's great. Now, now uh, the Crab Nebula is actually the, uh, the picture that we chose for the, uh, the space community on Google+. Yeah, you, that picture you chose is a little better than this one. I think I picked one from the Hubble Space Telescope, yeah. Yeah, this was a two-minute image, um, and I'm keeping my images short for various reasons I won't get into right now, but the um, uh, you can actually get, you can see some of the, um, the nebulosity in that, um, some of the wispiness uh, from, it's a supernova remnant, I'll let Phil talk more about it, but just in terms of the technique, this is a, a two-minute image, I cropped it, um, I stretched it a little bit, reduced the noise, and I, I put it in. And for those who are wondering where the Crab Nebula is in the night sky, it's in the uh, constellation of Taurus. Uh, you can actually see on Stellarium where I've pulled up the, the little targeting box to give you an idea of where it is in relation to Orion and <clears throat> Gemini and a few of the other notable objects. And it's not far from Jupiter it, right now. And I believe it was a supernova remnant from a, the supernova in, what was it? Was it 1066, Phil? I, 1054. I don't, 1054. You're thinking the Battle of Hastings. Ah, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, was on, it was in July of uh, 1054, according to uh, most of the historical records. Oh, there's some argument about that. But it's very clear it's about a thousand years old. You can actually, um, well, I'll get to that in a sec. But it's, it's the exploding debris from a star that was very massive and got to the end of its life and blew up. Uh, there is all this expanding stuff that's expanding like a, in a slightly football shape, what's called prolate shape. And that's what you're seeing um, in this. When you take deeper exposures or something like that, you get these incredibly gorgeous images and it looks like an explosion. It looks like expanding debris. And right in the center, which you can't really see in this picture, but in some other ones you can, is a tiny blue star, which is actually a neutron star. It's the, the remnant of the core of the star that exploded. The core collapses. The rest of the star blows out, but the core collapses down. You can get a black hole that way, um, but for some stars you get a neutron star, which is like the mass of the sun, compressed down into something that's like 10 to 20 kilometers across. So it's incredibly dense and spinning very rapidly and it's very hot. And it's got a tremendous magnetic field and all of that energy is pouring out into the, into the gas and lighting it up. But this is one of those stars that was so large and it just blew itself completely apart. Like this is one that, that still had a bit of a remnant left, left afterwards, right? Probably something like a 20 solar mass star, something 20 or something like that times the mass of the sun. And so the, there, there are different end products of different kinds of explosions. And sometimes they leave a neutron star like this one. Sometimes they leave a black hole uh, with supernova 1987A, which we detected in 1987. Uh, there's still no remnant that's been seen, which is weird. I mean, not well, remnant. I mean, there's no leftover right. compact object. There should be a neutron star in there, and we've never seen one. And nobody knows why. It's bizarre. Uh, it's one of the now, is it possible that it just went straight to black hole? Like it was, it was big enough that it did collapse into a black hole, and then it shouldn't have. Like, um, it shouldn't we have know right. actually quite a bit about the star that blew up, and it wasn't nearly big enough to leave a black hole. Um, and so it's it's just bizarre that there's just nothing there. Wow. Mm. Uh, so Mike is actually taking us on a tour of the moon. So uh, he had Ganymede there in, in there for a second. There. Let's see if he can bring it back. Yep. 
We have the Orion Nebula in the meantime. Yeah, I'm going to move over to Mark's view of the Orion Nebula. There you go. Now you got to work it, Mark. That's pretty. That's yeah, it took me a little bit of uh, software mess in here to, to get it to come up. How long of an, of an exposure did you have to do? Uh, this is 20... Uh, actually, yeah, 20 seconds. Well, that's not bad at all. That's fantastic. You know, Orion... Camera? I think one of the reasons why Orion is a favorite with a lot of uh, uh, people who do astrophotography is you really don't have to get a lot of integration time on it to get it, it to look really pretty. I mean, even five seconds, and you'll get um, a pretty nice little view. And then Mark, of course, is in the sort of light-polluted Chicago area, so you can see that, you know, even with a... And, and I think, you know, it's a it's a six-inch telescope, Mark? Is it? Uh, is th th this is through uh, an eight-inch uh, oh, this is the eight inch. Yeah. Oh, you've you've upgraded your gear, haven't you? Well, th this is uh, one I've borrowed from uh, somebody in my astronomy club. It's a uh, uh, nineteen seventy six uh, Celestron orange tube. So this, the <laughs> I know telescope's the... older than I am, but the optics <laughs> on it are fantastic. Yeah. Oh, well, that's fantastic. So that's interesting. So that you guys are both you and Mike are using essentially the same size telescope. That's really cool. Yeah, I think one of the differences between the setups is actually the way the optics are, right? So I have a different camera yeah. that has a narrower field of view, and his his doesn't have the extra barlow in it. So, Mike, if yeah. I understand correctly, too, you're also running. Um, you were talking about some of your optical train. You uh, in your little title bar down on your screen, you're running at f25. Right. Yeah. So it's a native f10, and then I put a 2.5x barlow in it. You see, I went the other way, and I, I have a focal reducer, and so right. it make, takes that f10 and brings it down to about a 6.3. Yeah. Right, and so the goal is to, you know, if you're going to do planetary stuff, you want to have a really narrow field of view, like what Mike's got here with f25, but if you want to do some of the larger, more fainter objects, you want to have sort of a wider field of view, and that's what... And that's what Mike's doing. Right. What Mike's doing. It's good to see the same aperture side by side, right, because you can, you can effectively do... You know, at different points in time, you can do the same thing with the same telescope. Yeah. Yeah, you could do the same thing. Um, oh, and Stuart, I believe, has... Oh, that's wonderful, Stuart. That's Andromeda, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, this is the Andromeda. Yes, this is, you know, obviously Andromeda. And I stretched it out a little bit, reduced the noise, and was able to bring out a little bit of the dust lanes. It's not quite as dramatic as what Gary can get, um, you know, but his setup's much much bigger, obviously. But I kind of like it. Just for, yeah, I think it's, it's fantastic. Two, two minute good exposure, yeah. So yeah, but you also have a lot less of that noise. You know, you've got had sort of that bluey quality to the background and now it's a little more um... well yeah it's it's darker now I, yeah uh, um so that's the the bluey quality was was the kind of the black background sky glow and um uh the um and the uh, and i i started putting some a little bit of noise reduction in the images you can see both satellite companions there too at least the yeah it's big. a perfect field of view for this yeah yeah, I was just going to mention that, Phil, that uh, he got it framed pretty nicely to show off its uh, satellites. I actually have my my ah. Milky Way model. All right, right? Let's so bring it up. this is something I made. It's it's three DVDs glued together with a picture of the of the galaxy on it, and the little red ball in the center is like the central hub. So this is the right proportions to be our Milky Way galaxy, and we're in the Milky Way. We're tilted something like like this. And we're looking straight out of the galaxy to the Andromeda galaxy as you see it there. So we're seeing Andromeda tilted, and I want to say it's a 17 degree angle to edge on. So it's like this. And in this image, which let's see, am I? I don't even know if I'm rotated the well, right way. Well, you're rotated the wrong way. So you, yeah, yeah, you want to do this that. Way. So we're looking down on the central bulge of the galaxy, and you can see that in the middle, the bright spot there in the middle. And you can see. Um, uh, the disk of the, the Andromeda galaxy, which is the flat part with the stars, and there's also a dust lane going right across the front of it, which is um, uh, just uh, basically soot. It's a, it's a complex organic molecule that's made when stars are born and when they die, and galaxies like Andromeda and like ours littered with it. Um, and so um, uh, you can see that in there. Also, as a bonus, off to the left, there's that little fuzzy dot that is a dwarf galaxy that orbits Andromeda. And in the lower right-hand corner is another one. It's fainter and a little bit bigger, spread out more, which is a second one. And Andromeda actually has quite a few of these, but those are the two big bright ones you can see easily through a telescope. 
pretty nice. It's a great view. Yeah, that's a that's a really fantastic view. I think this is thanks. You've got some really good clear seeing. I know you were a little nervous about tonight. You had some clouds haunting you, but I think you're you're yeah, seeing it, it perfect. It, it cleared up pretty nice, and the dew went away, which I'm really happy about because when I came out here, everything was just covered and what I almost aborted, but I said, "Nah, I can't let Fraser down." <laughs> <laughs> it's one year, man. It's one year. Go ahead, rub it in that I have rain. <laughs> well, I think if you, if things... you really wanted to join us, Gary, you would have made the weather better for yourself. I know. I I just missed that memo. <laughs> well, I think one of the things about Andromeda, you know, doing a lot of uh, outreach and doing, um, you know, a lot of um, telescope setups and stuff like like the things I do at ASU. When we have Andromeda up, to explain to people just exactly how big Andromeda is in the night sky. Um, that's one of the things that blows a lot of people's minds. It's huge, but it's pretty diffuse. So really, when we see that fuzzy spot in the sky when we're in a, in a, in a dark area, we're just seeing that central core. But if you could manage to see it in all of its glory, uh, if I remember correctly, it's something about six times the width of the full moon in the night sky. And Even that's more. amazing. I'm, I'm sorry, Phil? Even even more. Yeah. And it's two and a half million light years away. I mean, that's just something that blows a lot of people's minds, that it's that big in the sky, and it's that distant. And it's heading right for us. Yeah. <clears throat> in another 10 billion years. but if, if Two or four, I can never remember what it is. It w After the sun dies. No, it's before. Is it before? Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll see. Yeah, the Earth will still be around when uh, the Milky Way and Andromeda collide, but you don't have to like lie awake at night worrying about it. It's like, you know, I think it's four billion, 4 billion years from now. But it depends on what you mean. The two galaxies are heading toward each other, and they're going to pass through each other and then come back and eventually merge. That's yeah. going to take... I think that's what takes four billion years. The first pass is in two or three or something like that. You right, can look this I, up online. Everybody wrote about it when, when yeah. the paper came out last year. Milk, we, yeah, Milk Dromeda. Yeah. Or Milk Media. Milk anyway. But someone mentioned it. Someone described it, right? You know, people are worried that the stars are all going to bonk into each other, but they're really not. I mean, imagine you had two, I guess, two groups of soldiers and they shoot their bullets at some common area. And it's, you know, if the bullets are going to hit. You know. Yeah, I, I liken it to um, like two flies in a football stadium. That's about the average distance between stars compared to their size. Right. So you know, there there'll be a few impacts if you you know when you can consider how many stars are going to be flying past each other. But but really, they just will just pass right through each other and then just collect into this you know big elliptical galaxy ball. Yeah, and the cores in the cores where stars are denser, you're more likely to get that. Um, chances are, just ballistically, just the two of them uh, passing through each other, you won't get any. But um, in the core where things are denser and the gravity of the two galaxies start, starts to affect things, then you will get uh, collisions eventually. The stars will settle in there and they'll, they'll, uh, they'll wind up um, getting so close together and gravitationally interacting that some of them will fall towards the center and that's where you're going to start getting a lot of those physical impacts. On the other hand, there are two giant black holes in the centers of both of our galaxies. So that's also a bit of a a bit of a kick in the hornet's nest when it comes to those stars uh, barreling in. It's going to be quite yeah, a show. Question is, yeah, I mean, that's the question, is what's going to happen when those two supermassive black holes come together? Well, so, yeah, so they'll merge and we'll get a slightly bigger supermassive black hole. And possibly Thomas, a, a lot bigger than ours. But possibly one getting kicked, right? Yeah, I think that's unlikely, though. It depends on the rotation speed. Like, if the, you know, if it's relativistic speeds rotating that as they come in, one might get yeah. kicked out of the, out of the system. But, How off-center they are and everything, but it's possible yeah. that ours will get ejected from the system and Andromeda will take over. Because right. it has, like, um, it's, it's uh, 20 billion solar masses or more, and ours is only four. I know that Andromeda yeah. is a lot bigger. Yeah. Um, which is not also not terribly well understood why. Because the galaxy only has about twice the mass of ours at best. Or no, so, we're more massive, but it's bigger. It's, you know, the, the hard part about being a science journalist and writing about all this stuff and reading about it all the time is these arguments go back and forth, and then I, I can know, never remember I know, what I know. the latest thing is. And, and uh, it's just hard to remember everything. I learned all this from, you know, years ago, well, and every time somebody changes it. The classic one that I'm always watching is whether or not the, when the sun turns into a red giant, it's going to consume the Earth or not. And it, that literally flips every year. So this year, scientists yeah. have done the models and Earth is safe. Nope, scientists have done the models and Earth is doomed. Nope, scientists have done Depends the models and the Earth doomed. is safe. 
You know? Well, consumed, destroyed in yeah. the sun as the sun expands. So. Well, when the sun expands, though, um, right now it has it, it. Right now it doesn't even really have a surface. It's not like a solid surface of a planet. It just gets thicker and thicker until it's really thick. And when it expands, it's going to be even worse. So um, you can be inside of it and still be in a pretty decent vacuum. It's just that half your sky is now filled with stars, so it's going to be very hot. <laughs> and uh, 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 the Earth isn't going to isn't going to make it through this either way. I mean, it's going to melt. Uh, the crust will melt. But you know, whether we're physically inside the sun or not, yeah, it's, we'll it's interesting because the, the Earth is going around the sun, and if the sun expands past it, there'll be friction with the particles inside and, the sun. Right, and then it'll spiral inward, right? And it'll spiral in, right. and that'll spin. Uh, this is a, oh what a segue oh my god I gosh. know I know will there because, be a ball at the end uh, will there be a sphere that was once Earth when it's all said and done that's the and that's the well what what's really interesting is um, uh, uh, we do have a lot of these stars that have Jupiter or larger planets orbiting very close in closer even than Mercury orbits the Sun when those stars die and they expand past those planets and consume the planet the star is rotating very slowly but the planet is 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 revolving around the core much quicker and that actually spins the star up so you get these <laughs> anomalously quickly rotating red giant stars and when they blow off material instead of blowing it off in a sphere like the sun does they actually start to blow it off in these weird disks and and football shapes and all these kind of things and we think and here comes the segue for you, Fraser. We think this is why we get planetary nebulae, these, these shells around, sto around dying stars, that are all these bizarre shapes instead of being spheres. So that take it away, That is new Fraser. to me. That's totally new to me. You're kidding. Yeah, but anyway, segue. No, I, cut to I Stuart. Didn't, I, I didn't know I was going to cut to Stuart. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I got your segue, but I actually that is totally new to me. So I hadn't known that the... Uh, that those strange shapes might might have been caused by planetary interactions inside. Almost the certainly, planet. I'll get back to it in a minute. But really? Let's let's huh. see this. I I recognize it, but I can't think of which is one this, this is. Is this new ish? Uh, this is something I've shown a couple times before, but it's still my favorite object. It's the blue snowball cluster. It's the blue snowball, blue snowball and, nebula. I mean, nebula. I mean. And, and and what kind of object is it? <laughs> this is a planetary nebula. A planetary what? nebula, what? which which what? which as which as as uh, as mentioned by Phil Plait, could very well be the result of a planet uh, orbiting within the uh, envelope of its uh, parent star in its death throes. That's really cool. Do you know the cool. NGC number of this one? Yeah, give me a minute. Is it 6826? That's beautiful, though. I love the blue snowball. That's one of my favorite objects. And I really, it, it's great. I mean, last time it was just a blue puffball, but this time around, I'm putting it on my screen. It's not really helpful. Um, <laughs> I, I'm seeing this, like, white, almost like a white ring inside the snowball itself. That's exactly what you're seeing. Yeah, that is, that is these, really detailed, really fantastic. Really when I was a shot. kid, I wasn't that interested in these objects. The pictures we had of them weren't that interesting. And then when we started getting digital detectors in the 80s, uh, all of a sudden, we were seeing a lot more detail in these objects than had been possible to, to really see, especially with space telescopes. And all of a sudden, I was in grad school, and we had a we had a professor come and give a talk about these, and I just, it was like a light came on over my head. It's like, I totally understand everything I'm seeing with these objects. I'd never felt that before. And um, I, I actually, I, it's hard to tell. This picture is small, but on my screen... But if that's NGC 6826, I studied yeah. it for my this, this, this is this Sorry, this is 7662. Just looked at it. Okay, up. That's, uh, that's another one I observed, but I wound up not using it. It didn't do what I needed. Um, so this one's in Andromeda, right? Uh, let's see. Yes. No, this is, yeah, yes, it's, it's, yes, yes, it's yes, in Andromeda yes. uh, between Pegasus and uh, Cassiopeia. Have right. you got a Stellarium for us, Ray? I do. Um, if you'd like, I can pull that right up. Yeah. I actually have another planetary nebula for you after you show show Ray, so I'll show that. Oh, in a here we go. Okay, yeah. So this is a this is a perfect the, example of why they're called planetary nebulae. Um, they're green. It turns out that oxygen gives off green light, and there's enough oxygen in these things that they glow green. And when they're small and disc shaped, they look like planets. And then for years, we'd have to tell people it's an old name from 200 years ago. They're not really associated with planets. And then all of a sudden, 10 years ago. Uh, we started realizing, you know, maybe there are planets involved with shaping these things. So it's it's a pretty ironic thing. Oh. Ooh, which one is this? Uh, this, it, well, you're looking at me? 
Yes, Stuart. Yeah, this is uh, the Little Dumbbell Nebula. I've never done this one before. I just I've, found it. This is brand new. This, this is beautiful. This is brand new. Never seen it before. This wow. is uh, M76. And it's called the Little Dumbbell because it's little, and it sort of looks like the Dumbbell Nebula, which is way bigger than this. This is heavily cropped down. Um, but you can see it's got that green and, and yes, red in it exactly. as well. Yeah. The red is from uh, hydrogen, I think, if you've got that. Is this a three-color camera? No, th yeah, this is a modified uh, DSLR. So the 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 um, regular filter was removed, and then a an, an blocking filter was put in. Yeah, but it's still you know true yeah. color. Yes, more or this less. is true color more or less. So you see, red is where there's um, hydrogen and uh, nitrogen, I think. And um, I think, are there sulfur lines in the red? Those might be yellow. Sulfur, um, sulfur and the green is too. from oxygen. And it's very, very, very diffuse. This would be a hard laboratory vacuum. But it's so big, and, and there's so many atoms uh, across it. I mean, it's, it's a couple of light years across. It's several trillion kilometers across. So we see the gas in it. Although if you were in it, you'd, you'd hardly see anything Well, we always get that question, right? We always get that classic question was like, how close would you have to be for the Orion Nebula to look, you know, amazing in your, in your night sky? And the problem is never because... It gets complicated. You know, yeah, yeah, but, but essentially... These, these are just diffuse objects. And what happens is when you're in them or near them, the light gets spread out, and so you can't see them. Um, yeah, they Orion, never look like they do in Star Trek. Yeah. And <laughs> well, hiding and, in, the, in the nebula as you... Well, you're going to love you that. Yeah. I wrote about this years ago. I was struggling with writing about this for an, for an article. And then I wound up um, at dinner with Jeff Hester, who is the astronomer who took the famous Pillars of Creation picture from Hubble. And I was telling him about it, and he said, oh, no, no, no. In, in some nebulae like Orion, um, the gas is actually very thick. And so you can see some of that stuff. It wouldn't look like it does in the pictures. But you would see sort of these strings of filaments and things like that, the shock waves and all that. So it'd still be gorgeous. It just wouldn't be like in, yeah, like in, you know, Star Trek, like entering the Mutara Nebula and it's all red and pink and blue everywhere. It's not going to be like <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. And uh, speaking real quick of uh, the, the little dumbbell, I pulled up Stellarium for everybody so you can see where it is relative to everything else. Uh, it's in uh, Perseus um, and kind of nestled in like a little corner of it. Um, so you can see here on the screen, um, kind of in the neighborhood of Andromeda and Right. Uh, the double double and a few other uh, yeah. cool astronomical sites. It's really kind of halfway in between uh, the Orion, sorry, the uh, Andromeda galaxy and the double cluster. So if you mm -hmm. kind of know your your night sky, or, you, or you're adept at uh, star hopping. Yeah, yeah. Well, it doesn't look like there's much close to it, so it's kind of rough to to star hop there. Shouldn't be too hard with binoculars, though. Yeah. It's pretty small. Um, I really had to crop this down pretty heavily. Yeah. Well, you did it justice. It looks great. I'm going to go back shot. to Jupiter for a bit. Oh, Jupiter. <laughs> so if you want, I can show you some of the other moons here. This is this was Io. Yep. And it's jumpy enough that I don't know that we'll be able to tell much of a difference here. But I think the next closest one is Ganymede, which uh, if you have a telescope and you're headed out, I think in the next uh, couple of hours, it's supposed to go behind Jupiter here. So it's actually... Going to close the distance oh, there. There it is. Uh, there, yeah. Yes, see kinda... it. <clears throat> you can see it just a little white dot, yeah. kind of in the closer to the right of the screen. Now it's kind of in the right. middle of the screen. Nope, nope. Yeah. Now it's over to the right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to show you. There's one more off all the way out here. Let's see if I can find this one here. Well, as long as you guys can see it. There it is. <laughs> just, let me bring it down a little more here. I don't know which one is all the way out here. It's off. It's just off the top of the screen. I can see it. You guys can't <laughs> bring it down. Come on. We'll take your word for it. <laughs> it's like a herding cat. Sometimes. Yeah. There it is. See it? There it is. Coming down. No, I don't see it. Nah, no. I'm seeing nothing. We'll just have to take your word so for it. Top, top right, kind of almost in the center, oh, just uh, above. Yep. Yeah. Wait. No. Yes. No. Oh well. <laughs> oh, there it is. Yeah. I see it. I think you're all playing a joke on me. <laughs> It's it's probably just my screen here. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna move back to Stuart. Stuart. Stuart's moving fast. You told me to move fast. I know. I. I, I, <laughs> I what? No, me never. I might have encouraged. Uh, is... I might have encouraged a certain amount of haste. 
I, this is M33, and I, this is I, I took this uh, about half an hour ago, and um, and I, I put this up while I'm working on. I'm not. That's M, M34. Sorry, I'm working on M33 right now. So this is another. I think it's an open cluster, um, and I just think it's pretty. Yeah, open clusters are 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 great. Especially with binoculars, we had we were on the uh, we were on this cruise, and uh, two of the people brought these image stabilizing binoculars. Have you ever played with a pair of these? They're uh, awesome. Amazing! So they feel like they're alive. They, they it was so one was a twelve. I'm gonna see if I get this right. One was a twelve by twenty five pair, mm. and uh, and so and, and so what happens is inside the binoculars there's a accelerometer inside of it and then when you you hold the binoculars up to the object that you want to look at and then you press this button on it and then the image just goes rock solid and even though you're kind of jiggling the the binoculars around a little the 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 thing that you're looking at is perfectly stable just amazing so one was a I'm trying to think. Yeah, I think it was a 12 by 25, and and I think that's about a $300 pair of binoculars from Canon. The other one was a 20 by 50, oh, and geez. it was gigantic. And it's you about would a, need an image stabilizer for that. Yeah, and it, it's about a, I think it was a $1,300 set of binoculars. What a joy to use! Both of them, though, you could see the the moons of Jupiter. We could see, you know, open clusters, and that's where they really, you know, open clusters in binoculars. I think are my are my favorite way to see a lot of them. You know, the the bigger ones. Um, but you could see uh, Andromeda. You could see Orion, no problem. Just amazing. So uh, that's on my wish list now. <laughs> it's a, a pair of image stabilizing binoculars. Just a you can imagine for birding and, and stuff like that. Just phenomenal. That's great. Well, if anyone's interested, um, here is a little bit of a target location for M34 in the night sky. Uh, we're kind of still in the same general region, um, yeah. you know, with with uh, a lot of these objects that we've been uh, showing off with uh, Stewart's telescope. So that kind of gives everybody a, a decent idea of where where this one's at in the night sky. Now, uh, Mark is going to be hooking up his his telescope to view Jupiter as well, so I thought we would uh, take one last look at his view of Orion, because it's just gorgeous. Yeah. Actually, real quick while he's doing that, Stuart, what do you have pulled up? It looks... Uh, this is M33, the Triangulum uh, Galaxy. Gal galaxy, that's where yeah. I thought you were going to. Oh, right. that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah it's, mm -hmm. it's a, I'm getting a little... Um, uh, star trailing in it, but I thought it was good enough to, to show. Well, and interestingly enough, us astronomers are like the worst at naming things, so interestingly enough, the Triangulum Galaxy is in the constellation of Triangulum. Right. So, amazingly enough. Really How is that bad? That. That's a good thing. <laughs> no, um. I, know, I just always joke about the fact that, you know, we, you know, just in science in general, you know, we have, you know, Ohm's Law, and we have you know all these different things that are just plainly named, and it uh, it works. I just think it's funny. <laughs> it's um, <laughs> go ahead, Fraser. Oh, I was just going to say that you can I mean, you can really see the spiral arms in in yeah. M thirty three. That's a face on spiral galaxy, so it's like we're looking at it like this. And um, if you can see, I don't know if I'm if people can see me or not. I've got my picture locked on the galaxy, but uh, you're seeing a face on spiral galaxy. It's actually pretty dinky. It's not nearly as big as we are in Milky Way or Andromeda. And it's got um, fairly wide open arms. They're patchy. What I love about this picture is if you look to the upper right, there's sort of a pinkish clot, uh, you know, about more than halfway from the center of the galaxy out to the edge of the picture. And it's, it jumps kind of jumps right out of you. Once you see it, it's a different color. That is NGC 604. I happen to know that. Um, it is a huge gas cloud forming star forming region, um, which is the rival of anything we have in the Milky Way. It's much bigger than Orion, the Orion Nebula, um, and so even from you know two and a half, two point nine, or whatever million light years away, it's one of the most prominent features in that galaxy. It's really something. There's a Hubble photo of it. If you look up NGC 604 and Hubble, uh, yeah. I, I really wish Hubble would go back and reobserve that with the new cameras because uh, it's one of my favorite objects in the sky. It's fascinating and gorgeous. Mm. Well, it's just like how some of the like the nicest uh, areas of nebulas, like the um, the tarantula and stuff, those aren't even located in our galaxy. 
you know, there's there must be just some phenomenally huge star forming regions in other galaxies, things like this that are that dwarf anything that we would see with the Orion Nebula. And again, you know, imagine if we were closer and viewing them, you know, right. if we were perhaps in the same galaxy and able to view them as opposed to viewing them from <clears throat> you know, two and a half million light years away. Well there is one called yeah. the Dragonfish in the Milky Way that's huge. It completely smashes Orion Nebula into obscurity. But it's located on the other side of the galaxy where it's really hard to see. If you look up Dragonfish Nebula on the web, you'll find some spectacular pictures of it. Um, but it's it's in the infrared because there's so much crap, dust between us and it, yeah. that it's almost it's basically invisible to the uh, to, to visible light to the eye. Stuart. It's amazing though, it's really cool. We need and to get a, a spacecraft outside the Milky Way to look back and yeah. and be able to fully map out all of the objects in the Milky Way. Hope you're patient. <laughs> You've got M seventy four in the same area, Stuart. I do. Cool. Yeah, M seventy four is pretty close to where you are right now. Okay, I'll I'll check. I'll I'll get that next. I'm trying to get the double cluster right now. Okay, I haven't been of much help to you. Now so. we've got a request to see uh, Comet C two thousand and twelve K five, and Mark, you I think did a video of that, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I've got a video of it. I took on Friday night. Uh, well, it's not a video. It's technically a time lapse of about a. Uh, little over an hour's worth of images. Yeah, yeah. If you want to go ahead and show that, that would be great. Yeah, I'll sure. I, I can bring you. that up. Yeah. Give me just a sec. <clears throat> and now this, of course, isn't this uh, Comet Ison, which we're all anticipating for the uh, the end of the year. That's going to be something. I cannot wait for this comet. We'll uh, see. We'll see. Are you, are you, how As, skeptical are you feeling about this comet? <laughs> Here comes... Debbie Downer. <laughs> as, as the great skeptic, what are, what are your odds for it being spectacular? I lived through Kahootek, so um, comets are unpredictable. And uh, Ison, this comet, is big, and it, it looks like it's going to be in the right position in the sky to be incredibly bright. The, the optimistic estimates make it you know, as bright as the moon, which is entirely possible. Mm -hmm. But comets get bright because they have uh, ice under their surface, frozen, what we would think of as gases, ammonia, water, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, things like that. They get near the sun, that stuff turns into a gas and expands, reflects sunlight and makes comets very bright. But some comets don't have that much ice, and so they don't give off that much stuff, and they don't get that bright. And it can be very difficult to predict. So, um, you know, the conservative estimates for ICON still make it a, a, a nice object, but we just don't know. So I haven't written about it yet, and I've been meaning to, because I keep getting email about it, and people saying, yeah. it's going to be so bright, we're going to read by it. And it's like, well, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe. It, that could happen. No laws of physics are getting broken by that, right? That's possible. It's within the realm of possibility. Yeah, and, yeah. and I've seen a, a, a whole pile of naked eye objects, uh, naked eye comments, and a few years ago there was one that was visible in, in daylight. I saw it uh, at noon on a Sunday. You had to know right where to look. Um, at, I would love to see that again, believe me. Um, I just don't know if this one's going to do that or not. We'll know better in the coming months if it gets brighter. Right. It's, it's, it's going to be somewhere in between almost invisible and the brightest comet in human history. Uh, yeah. Somewhere in, somewhere in that range. How bright did Halley's Comet get in 1910 when we passed through the tail? I don't even know. I don't know. Well, I mean, you know, if it hits the high end of the estimates, though, this will be the brightest comet. That's what people are saying, that it'll be the brightest comet that's pretty much ever been seen. That's actually a problem. That makes it hard to observe. <laughs> oh, really? Well, yeah, yeah, if you have a big I've, telescope, how do you yeah, observe heard, it's as bright I've as heard, the moon? Up, yeah, I've heard estimates as, well, I've heard estimates as high as 17 times the brightness of the moon, you know, so higher than the magnitude of the moon. No but, way. But, um, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's what we've heard, but it's more diffuse, so it's going to be big, but it's going to be, so it right. won't be like a, like a point brightness the way the moon is, it'll be this diffuse brightness that's quite large and over a large chunk of the sky. So, so you know, I mean, it's hard, you know, as, you know, we get, we really try hard not to get caught up in the in the breathless enthusiasm of this, and yet, it you know, it could be neat. So I'm, uh, you know, like I said, somewhere in between completely invisible and the brightest comet that's ever been seen. Right. So if it falls within that spectrum, I'm gonna, I, my prediction will have been correct. <laughs> nice. Well, that was great, Mark. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. I love it when we can, we can fulfill someone's request just like that. Not a problem. Um...
Do we have and, it? Uh, oh, there it is. Oh, sweet. Had it on the wrong wrong window. That's yeah, this, nice. is, this is a 10-second loop. It, it's about a little over an hour's worth of uh, pictures in each exposure. It's about 20 seconds. Oh, it's screaming then. You did this on Friday, right? Oh, can you can you email? Yeah, this was Friday and, and night. Did you, how have you got this? This is on. How did you it, do this it, video? Uh, I have it uploaded to YouTube. So if you look in my stream, okay. you should you should be able okay. to find a link for yeah, it. Can you just drop me an email, and then I think we'll we'll post this in Universe today because it's pretty sure. good. Sure, that'd yeah. be awesome. Yeah. And I'll wait till you do it, then I'll poach it from you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it was actually great. the The space community has been coming along really well. It's been we've got about seventy thousand people. It's actually the largest community on Google Plus now, and it's been actually a source of a lot of stories for me. It's quite funny. Oh, um, really? Yeah. Well, you saw that. You see that image of like Mars that someone had done, like had shown a blue version of Mars yeah. with the water and the. So, so the person actually created that and posted it right into the space community for uh, for Thad Zabo, who's one of our one of our one of the people who hangs out on the virtual star party and uh, and then I saw that picture and went oh we've got to do a story on this and so so we jumped all over it and, and damn I wish I'd beat you to it that went mega viral I'm seeing it everywhere I know I know so we so it came, the original source was the space community so, so wow it's pretty, yeah and there's, there's been a bunch of stuff that's come through the space community that's been really great so I'm, I'm really pleased so if you haven't I'm hoping that many of the people watching this now are, are members of the space community on Google Plus but if you're not uh, you can access it in the new community section of Google Plus, and it's great. Well, real quick, back to uh, the the point of that uh, that Mars image. You know, without being too much of a sci-fi fanboy, I really love seeing people's interpretations of what Mars could have looked like. You know, three or four billion years ago. Um, it's it's really interesting to see all those different interpretations. And of course, now as we get much better data. <clears throat> From from all the different orbiters, and and of course you know things like Curiosity and Opportunity, um, getting much better data, we can further refine that instead of it being stuff like you know from the early 1900s with you know the Barsoom series, you know and and canals and all sorts of you know funny stuff. Now we're actually you know getting you know more sophisticated models and and better information to be more realistic about what Mars could have looked like. Um, oh, I'm gonna go back to to Stuart. That's right. I told I asked Stuart politely to hustle. So, um, so now what, is this the double cluster, Stuart? Yes, it's the double cluster. Not framed really well, but um, it's the best I can do under the circumstances. And um, this is a 30 second exposure, and I kept it short so I wouldn't get a lot of background noise. And you can get an idea of that it's two clusters right next to each other. It's kind of cool. Again, a, a phenomenal object to see in binoculars. So if you have a pair of binoculars, go out and check out the double cluster, and it's just great. And uh, I think Ray is going to show us where to find it. Yeah. I am. And uh, this would be in the constellation of Perseus. Um, I'll zoom out a little bit so you can see kind of like the, uh, the night sky here. Uh, we're looking more or less due north. Um, in the center is our, our famous north star, Polaris. And you go a little bit above that. And you have the double cluster, and I'll zoom in a little bit so you can kind of see. And it's you can actually see it with the unaided eye too. I mean, you can see if you can find Cassiopeia, which is that W in the sky, then it's usually just a little below Cassiopeia, and you can see it, you know, on the way to Perseus. I always imagine Perseus is like this, this triangle or spear going up it's towards a lambda. Cassiopeia. <laughs> it's a lambda, yeah. Yeah, it's a like an upside down Y. It's a lambda. Yeah. And the and the double cluster is just right below Cassiopeia, so it's a it's a really easy object to find. It looks beautiful in binoculars. Uh, I highly recommend that if you if you've got the if you're outside and you want to know what you should be looking at. And Apoc, that, uh, just a gorgeous picture of it a week ago or so. Whoa! And I, Cassiopeia can actually let you um, you can navigate from Cassiopeia over to uh, the Andromeda Galaxy as yeah. well. So the the double cluster and Andromeda very easy targets to hit um, if you can lock in on uh, Cassiopeia. Um, they're they're really easy objects to to navigate to. And if you've got you know dark skies, they're they're two objects that you can see with your with your own eyeballs too, so which is great. So I can see them from my place. So walk, you know, go for a walk at night. If you've got a clear skies, you can definitely see things. You can see you can see the double cluster. You can see Andromeda. You can see um, uh, the Orion Nebula and a few other bright objects. But that's pretty much it. The uh, Great Globular Cluster in Hercules, uh, M thirteen, I believe. You can see that um, with your with your eyes. I've never I can't. been able to see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
He's got young eyes. I've seen Omega Sen, Omega Centauri, but that's a bigger, yeah. brighter cluster, but I've never seen M13. That's amazing. To me, so, M13 looks like, um, the, the same way that it looks to my eyes is kind of how um, the Orion Nebula looks. It looks like a fuzzy star. It's, it's almost like um, looking at stars with like dry eyes or something where it, it's not crisp. It's got like a fuzziness to it is, is at least how it looks to me. I always use that trick where you, you, know, you don't look at the object directly, you look off to the side and then you notice some blurry thing in your peripheral vision and then you turn back and then you can see it. I'm, I've, I know that that's sort of a, a way that you can try and spot objects. I don't know why that works though. I do. Oh yeah? <laughs> Kinda. <laughs> it's, just the con it's the construction of your eye. The, um, uh, because the, the optic nerve comes into the back of your eye, the most sensitive cells to light are actually around that part of your eye. They're not in the center where the light focuses. So um, if you look away from an object a little bit, um, it's, it's tough to do. Psychologically, it's tough to do. But when you look away from an object, it actually becomes clearer, or at least brighter. And it, that's very um, standard in looking at planetary nebulae like we were looking at earlier through a telescope. The ring nebula is a great example of this. Uh, it's, a, it's a perfect smoke ring. And it's, it's beautiful and bright and tiny and, and just so gorgeous through an eyepiece. When you look right at it with a, like a six or eight inch telescope, poof, it's gone. And then you look a little bit away from it, and bang, there it is. And then you, you, you see it and you go, oh, and then it's gone again. It's, uh, <laughs> well, and interestingly enough, uh, whenever we set up stuff at ASU for our astronomy open house, whenever I'm putting objects in the telescope, and when I train people, I tell them never to put you know, things like the ring nebula or Andromeda or anything like that in the center of the eyepiece. I always have them go off center because it kind of tricks people into using that averted vision because right. people will naturally want to look right in the center of the eyepiece. So if we frame the objects just off center, you know, then we get a lot of people who, oh, wow, that's awesome, you know, rather than people going, hey, where is it? I can't see anything. And then we worry, you know, that our telescope's not aligned or we didn't put it on the object or somebody bumped it, et cetera. Yeah, just Mine never lands in center. I think there's an entry <laughs> on Wikipedia, I think, for averted vision. I remember looking at it a long time ago. So, Stuart, what are we looking at now? Uh, hang on. Um, I can ex also explain the the there are two types of this is M74, but in terms of the eye, when you're looking directly at something, you're looking at the macula, which is mostly cones, and the cones are bright eye are bright light and colors, and the rods are off to the side, so that's why you have to look off to the side, and so you want to make sure that you're not looking right right at it because your your focusing is right on right on the macula. Uh, this is M74. Uh, this is the one that Gary said. This is next to uh, M33, um, and it's another face on spiral. You can kind of see it. This is a two-minute yeah. exposure, and uh, it's much smaller than uh, M33, and I had to crop this one down quite a bit as well. I think this is a first again. It, it is. I've never, I've never seen this before. No, we've never seen this in the star party before. And for those that are curious, this is actually in the constellation of Pisces, um, in the neighborhood of uh, Aries and Andromeda and Triangulum. So again, still kind of in the same, you know, northern-ish area of the sky. And um, I will zoom in on it a little bit and see if I can get... Oh, there we go. So someone's asking for Pleiades. Uh, can you pull that up, Stuart? Uh, sure, I can try. It'll be... Um, I won't be able to get the whole thing because I don't have my focal reducer on, but I can do my best. I don't know the amount of Andromeda you were getting there. I wouldn't be surprised if you get a pretty big chunk uh, of it. I'll, 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 let me, let me, I'll, move, I'll slow over. Okay. Uh, that's M thirteen, right? What M? What no, M is it? Pleiades is yeah. like forty five, isn't it? Is, I, I don't know. I, I um, someone will look it up here. <laughs> All you people with things inside the actual uh, Let's see. Milky Way. Yeah, it's M45. M45. Okay. <laughs> I have to run. I have to okay, go well, now. thanks a lot. Thanks for coming, Phil. And, and thanks, thanks for the note. Thanks for a year. Yeah, this is very exciting. I can't believe yeah. it's been a year. And think of all the stuff that's happened. I mean, I know, uh, I know. Being that's on the crazy. Google, that, that, that Google documentary about with you and Pamela and. Yep. Did, I, I don't know. Did you see this happen when you guys were on the cruise? Did you see the uh, the end of the year Google Hangout video they put together? Yeah, yeah. And they included our yeah. 
That's right. They covered our curiosity uh, coverage. Yeah. They cut to uh, Miles O'Brien and Amy Shira Titel, and then uh, they showed us, and that was really cool. For like one second, we were up on that uh, <laughs> that video. That was pretty awesome. There you go. Uh, well, let's let's hope something even more interesting happens this year. I'm not sure if anything will though. We've got anything big. Come, yeah, Comet Ison, and then we've got uh, what 2015. There's another. Um, well, there's New Horizons. That's that will do. That's in June. That passes Pluto. Yeah. And yeah. Dawn gets to Ceres. The the probe Dawn, which is which was orbiting the asteroid Vesta, is on its way to Ceres. It's going to be there in 2015. And then there's the uh, there's a big uh, total solar eclipse that's going to buzz right across the United States. Yeah, that's that's a four-hour drive north of my house into Wyoming. So I am now, absolutely that's in what 2017. Yeah, I'm yeah. absolutely seeing that one live. Yeah, there's yeah. no question. I Everybody's going to be live. flooding into Branson, Missouri. Yeah, so that's why I'm going to be in the middle of nowhere in Wisconsin or Wyoming, yeah. where I know it's going to be clear. I'm going to head to Idaho. <laughs> yeah, All right, thanks everybody. Well, thanks, Phil. It was great to see you. I think we're we're thanks getting right to the end. Us. We'll probably need to uh, to wrap this up. We'll we'll take one last crack at uh, at Pleiades, and then I think we'll uh, we'll wrap this up. Working on it. How's that coming? Well, and and until Almost then, why don't there. we why don't we enjoy this beautiful view of Jupiter, and then this other beautiful view of Jupiter? This is great. So uh, so both Mark and Mike have got their views of Jupiter going, so we can see. And what's great is they're both uh, it's the same size telescope. So you can really see the the difference between them. Dueling Jupiters. Dueling Jupiters, yeah, and the colors, of well, course. Well, what's amazing, too, is looking at this, you know, we're looking at the different uh, focal ratios. Uh, one of the reasons why, Fraser, I've never done uh, the, the times where I have had my telescope here in the, the BSB, why I've never done planetary is mine's an F4. And in all the times that I've ever tried to do anything with Jupiter or Saturn, my telescope is is practically worthless. But, you know, when it comes to pulling up, you know, nebula, pulling up galaxies, you know, getting these great wide field views. And that's actually what I bought my telescope for. I actually specifically wanted something with a with a wide field of view to be able to collect a lot of light for for dim objects. Um, no offense to doing anything with planetary. If I, if I want to look at Saturn and... Uh, and Jupiter and Mars, I can just pull out my dob and you know park it while I'm imaging. But uh, you know that that is interesting to see these these focal ratios side by side and kind of compare the differences in what we can see. Yeah. So Stuart, this is your this is your crack at Pleiades. Yeah, like I said, I'm not getting all of it. So, <clears throat> How many sisters do we see here? Four. Something like that. Yeah. Five. But you can see a little bit of the blue nebulosity around. A yeah. Around. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, well, this has been really great. Well, thank you very much, guys. Uh, I think this is a wonderful sort of wrap-up to a first year and shows kind of how far we've come in the, in the last year. I mean, we still had some bad weather, but still, I mean, a beautiful view from, from Mike and Mark and, and really great views from, from Stuart for some of the deep sky stuff. So, so we're able to kind of get all, all our bases covered. Um, wonderful. So, uh, well, I think we're. Uh, I think we'll, we'll wrap this up right now. So again, so thank you very much, Stuart, for braving the cold uh, San Francisco winter. I know it's been uh, it's been really hard on you out there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's it's. Uh, yeah, I, I shouldn't whine, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, Mark was noting what, was wondering for, about perspective on what's it like to have cold in uh, San Francisco. Yeah, it's uh, um, forty five degrees for people who are who are. Uh, <laughs> Who are wondering? That's a that's above freezing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, all right. Well, it was wonderful. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Mark. That's great. Great telescope. Keep borrowing that telescope. That was fantastic. Man. Well, as soon as my wife lets me buy one of my own, I'll bring it back to to the guy. <laughs> <laughs> so that might be never. You'll you'll be keeping that one for a while then. Yeah. Um, yeah, but and definitely drop me an email and I'll uh, we'll we'll see about running that in the uh, in universe today. That was a fantastic video. I loved it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um. And Mike, thank you yes. very much again. And and Always. you're one of the one of the founding members of this team. So still hanging in there, and I'll yeah. be here as long as I can. Yeah. So one year, man. That's fantastic. Yeah. It's fun. I love Crazy. It. I know. Anyway, well, thank you very much, uh, yep. and thanks Ray for bringing the bringing the knowledge. And Gary, thank you very much for being a, sort of our spiritual advisor tonight. When we didn't have uh, your clear skies, you one time had rain, but you still showed up to uh, to cheer us on. So thanks a lot. Yeah. Anyway. What else can I say? 
It's not the same without you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need that. We need that H alpha cranking again. So, all right, hopefully man. next week. All right, and so until next week, uh, we'll wrap up the virtual star party. Thank you, every. Thank you very much, everybody, and we'll see you all uh, next week. Hopefully, Bye we'll yeah. have our team back together. So we'll be. Uh, <laughs> we'll see you next week. All right. Hey, see you later. Good night. Bye.